The Entrepreneur's Library, episode 50. Welcome to The Entrepreneur's Library, the only book-centric podcast that reviews all the top-selling business books and shares authors' perspective firsthand. This is your resource to finding the next great book that will enable you to grow personally and professionally. Welcome your host, Wade Danielson. Thank you for joining us on The EL. Today, we have one of my favorite authors, Mike Michalowicz, author of multiple different books, but the book that we'll be covering today is The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. Welcome, Mike, and thank you for joining us on The Entrepreneur's Library. Oh, thanks for having me, Wade. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Will you take just a moment to introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about you personally? Sure. I'm Mike Michalowicz, and uh, I'm an author of a few books, Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, which we're going to be talking about today, and The Pumpkin Plan and Profit First. And uh, I'm an entrepreneur, or, or I was about to say retired entrepreneur. I don't know if that's the word, but... Uh, Prior to becoming an author, I was a full-time entrepreneur, growing a couple companies. Um, today, I'm fortunate enough to have have some more businesses I'm involved in. But my the forefront of my activities is is writing books and talking about them and and supporting other entrepreneurs in their endeavors. Mike, thank you for sharing that. Now let's jump right into your book that you were just referencing, the Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, which I'm showing. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. Was first made available on September 24th, 2008. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Which is my birthday, by the way. That's why oh, the, nice. we picked that day. Yeah. Now, I wasn't born in 2008. That was simply the day. The <laughs> that was your birthday. Yeah, my birthday, but not the birth year. <laughs> you, are, you are wise beyond your years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm five now. Yeah. So, Mike, we're going to move quickly, but here are the top questions that the, our reader slash listener really wants to get answered. And the first one is, what was the inspiration behind writing The, the Toilet Paper Entrepreneur? You know, it's kind of my retaliatory stage of being an entrepreneur, of being an author, and I just wanted to challenge all the academic reads that have been out there. I, I, I believe there's a lot of great content books. I believe in books more than anything. I'm an avid reader myself, but most of the books I was reading about business were kind of, you had to bore your way through it. And so I said, I'm going to write this retaliatory book, this kind of just edgy, raw, my perception of what entrepreneurship is and how you can navigate uh, starting and building a business when you have no resources. So that's what the Toy Paper Entrepreneur is, how to get it done when you have nothing. So Mike, when I pull up brand new books, uh, and any given month in Amazon, I'll look at entrepreneur, you know, the actual subtitle of entrepreneurship. And there can be anywhere from like 90 to 150 books that come out new each month. Oh, no. So this is where this next question you, you becomes very relevant. And that's what makes your book different from others regarding the same topic? Well, I think it's the analogy I use. So uh, I have to argue that the content that I talk about, I think that anyone talks about, it has been addressed by others in different ways. So for a book to be fresh, it just has to be a new spin. It could be old old adages, but a new spin. So Toy Paper Entrepreneur, I connected entrepreneurship to the bathroom experience. And specifically, if you're ever stuck in the bathroom with three sheets of toilet paper, well, we've Everyone's been there, you know, but no one really talks about that situation, yet we find a way to navigate it. We find a way to survive, if you will, on three sheets. And that's what true entrepreneurship is. We often get caught with our pants around our ankles, aren't aware of it, and now we don't have enough money to continue our business. At least we perceive we don't. We don't have enough contacts. We don't have enough sales coming in. And I argue when you're in that situation, innovation is what will get you out of it, and that's your biggest ally. So the toilet paper entrepreneur is all about leveraging the fact that what you have is enough and how to innovate con consistently in all facets of your business to grow wildly successfully. With the way that you wrote this book, how would you suggest the reader engage with it? Is this one that they should really start from the beginning and work their way all the way to the end? Or is this one that they can, uh, they can jump in and grab different concepts and jump back out? You know, all the books I write, are, are they build on the prior concept. So this isn't a jump in, jump out. It's a, it's a read through. But, and I should say, at the end of each chapter, and I've done this for every book I've written, has specific actionable steps. So when someone's done reading a chapter, it says, here's the three things you should do immediately that will apply to your business. And then when you get to chapter two, if you haven't taken the first action steps, you haven't put the foundation in place and it won't work. So it's definitely a read through. Great. So Mike, now that we know the background behind the book and what it's all about, let's, uh, let's do, this is my favorite part of the interview in which we really just take a deep dive into the book. I'm going to hand over the mic to you and let you just roll through. I like we were talking, like like uh, you were telling a friend about what your book is all about. 
Yeah. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll walk you through the book. I, I broke Toy Paper Entrepreneur down into three significant segments. It's, it's belief, focus, and action. And so in the first part, and it's broken into three chapters, but in the first part of the book, it's really about the mental game of entrepreneurship, a big part that's not talked about. So you, many authors and blogs and all different resources talk about the strategies, and they definitely apply. But the big question first is, is your mind behind it? And so in the first chapter, I call it Nature's Calling. Now, in this one, I totally went overboard with the uh, scatological kind of uh, suggestions and induendos. But what I mean in, with Nature's Calling is what do you feel naturally compelled to do? That if you and I, Wade, were starting businesses and maybe I come in with all this experience and I come in with money uh, and all these resources and you're going to the exact same business as me without those, but you are absolutely passionate about this. This is your life vision for yourself. This is your dream for yourself. And for me, it's just a way to get rich, get rich quick. You're probably going to beat me in the business because no business or I shouldn't say no business, but it's a very, 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 very rare circumstance that you start a business and it just hits out of the park. We all run into obstacles and challenges and so forth. So it's the guy or gal that walks into a business that's passionate about it, that's going to see the business through the, the dip, the dark period, the quiet period, because they're doing what they love to do. So a lot of people say, what's your passion? I'm taking it one step further in this chapter and talking about what's your purpose? Passion is something you, you love to do, and that's a very important component, but purpose is there's a reason why you're doing what you do. So when the challenges present themselves and business is struggling, that you have the internal conversation going on, well, there's a reason I'm doing this beyond the money, and that's what gets you through those dark periods and ultimately to make uh, a pretty substantial living doing what you're doing. And then the second chapter, I call it uh, a little peace and quiet in your mind. And what I talk about in this chapter is the power of beliefs in how they can either be a wall or a channel. So when I say, I'm not going to be able to get this report done on time, for example, maybe I make a commitment to a client that I'll have a report to them at the end of the, the day. And I say to myself, I can't get this report done. Well, we are all wired in our minds to prove ourselves right. So when I say I can't get something done, it's as strange as it sounds, to my best mental interest to not get it done. Conversely, if I say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this done, I, I will find a way to get done. So our beliefs can be channeling where they can move us toward an accomplishment or they can be a wall. So when it comes to entrepreneurship, we got to investigate what is the internal conversation going on in our heads and then leverage that or convert it into a channel. A channel gets to our vision, a wall will prevent us from getting there. And then the third chapter, I talk about just the, the fire in your belly. I referenced it earlier. It's, it's the why. So we've talked about passion, what we're passionate about. But the question really is, what's your purpose? And when you know what your purpose is in your business and how it connects with you, you'll know why you're doing it. And that keeps driving it forward. And it's just those parts that put together the beliefs. And I totally believe, Wade, like that's the foundational component of entrepreneurship that so many people miss is, is the mental game. You know, is you get your head in it. Then in the next chapters... The next couple of chapters, I talk about getting down to the um, the actual execution of your ideas. One strategy that I talk about <clears throat> in here that I really strongly suggest is a strategy called tacking. And tacking comes from an analogy or, or a strategy used by sailors. And this is how it works. <clears throat> Excuse me. When When someone puts a sailboat into the ocean or into a lake or whatever – they pick a target on the horizon of where they want to go. They want their boat to go to that little island in the distance, for example. But they don't go in a straight line. You know, the wind is blowing in a particular direction. They need to leverage it. There could be other boats navigating the waters, and if they went straight, they could have a collision. There could be obstacles in the water. There could be a tidal change if they're in the ocean or currents. So they use a technique called tacking. And what tacking does is you identify that spot on the horizon where you're going, that island, but you go for only about 100 or maybe 200 yards going uh, in a direction that may not be direct toward it. It may be a diagonal, but still in the general direction. But what that diagonal is doing is it's avoiding obstacles. It's leveraging the wind and the currents. It's moving the boat. 
Then after you travel those like 200 yards or something, you redirect the boat. You look, where was your destination again? You align to as best as you can, but also leveraging the current winds and the current tides and so forth. And you push hunt forward another 200 yards. Then you again realign. And what happens is like a zigzag pattern, but you ultimately, and every time you get to your destination. And it's an important analogy to use in business. It's so many of us told us, uh, so many of us have been told that a the shortest distance between where we are today and where we want to be is a straight line. You know, rock and roll, go go directly where you want to go. Don't worry about anything else, just drive forward. And I think that's a mistake. I think we have to realize that there's a macro economy going on. You know, 2008 was a was a tough time and a lot affected a lot of businesses. Some businesses leveraged it. Some businesses repositioned themselves to serve customers that were experiencing uh, less income into their households, for example. And it's the businesses that adjusted to those tidal changes, if you will, or those new wins that were the ones that were successful and have zigzagged their way to where they want to be. I suggest in Toilet Paper Entrepreneur that every 90 days, that's the equivalent to 200 yards. Push your forward, your business forward for 200, I'm sorry, for 90 days uh, as best you can. Then stop, see where you stand compared to the vision that you want to achieve and then redirect your corporate ship, if you will, uh, and push forward again and then you'll zigzag your business there. And then, and then the final part of Toilet Paper Entrepreneur or the final section, I should say, is the, uh, the action section. W- one of the biggest actions that entrepreneurs can take is to, is to have a discipline of saying no. Uh, there's a saying that I like to use now. It's you grow by saying no. And there was a study of successful entrepreneurs and struggling entrepreneurs defined by people that have achieved financial success and a vision for their business that they wanted versus people that were living check by check and did not have the vision they had for their business. And they found one of the greatest differentiators were successful entrepreneurs say no at a rate of 10 times more than they say yes, while struggling entrepreneurs say yes 10 times more than they say no. So an opportunity presents itself, the struggling guy will say, yeah, 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 another opportunity. The uh, focused guy uh, the successful guy will say, no, no, I got to stick with what I'm doing and really become masterful at it. And then there's quite a few stories I share in this section and strategies, but another one that maybe is the ultimate no to everything else is uh, it's a story I call Burn the Boats. There, uh, And this story has been told in many versions, but basically in the um, medieval days, there was a rookie uh, general of an army. Um, the army, the small army had been devastated so much that they brought on a, a, a new guy with very little inex- experience. And they said, we got a, a big issue here. This other army we're fighting is destroying us. This is our last really kind of shot in the dark attempt to turn the tides of this war. And uh, what we need to do is there's an island out in the ocean that we need to take control of. They've taken control of it. It's the entryway to all our imports and stuff, they've cut us off. We need to take recapture the island. Now, they're a better equipped army. They have way more experience, better weapons. They're way better financed. We're smaller. They're on the defensive. We'll be on the offensive. Uh, it's basically a death trap. But the general was sent out with his army. He lands on the island. And the very first instruction he gives his army is to burn the boats they just landed on. And being loyal soldiers, they burn the boats, their own boats. And the general looks at him and says, now there's only two ways off the island, gentlemen. Either we are victorious or we die. And, of course, they were, they were victorious. You know, when there's no option for retreat, when there's no way off, the chances of your success increase dramatically because it has to work. It doesn't mean it's guaranteed to work. You may proverbially die. But when there is no alternative, the odds of it happening become much greater. Too many entrepreneurs pull that retreat trigger way too early. It's too scary. It's too hard. And and they just pull the retreat trigger and are off to the next thing and realize that's too hard and so forth and, and just perpetually struggle. So in Toy Paper Entrepreneur, I talk about how to burn the boats in your business um, so that there is no plan B. It's plan A and all in on plan A. And uh, there may be variables in it. You will have to tack like we talked about earlier, but you execute on plan A until it works. And then the book wraps up. I, I talk about money and equity. It's an important, extremely important component. I talk about how to do, how to grow a business when you don't have money, when you don't have those resources. But there are ways to, you know, money is a necessary vehicle. You can't do it 
do things with nothing at times. So how do you extract some money um, when, when you don't have traditional financing in place? Um, and then when you do consider more traditional financing, maybe bringing on a partner or a angel investor or something like that, how do you go about that? So I give strategies there. And that's the essence of the toilet paper entrepreneur. I, I think it gives an aspiring entrepreneur all the tools to get ready and the big kick in the ass to actually get started. And I think for established entrepreneurs, it realigns them with where they are and, and what their relationship is to their business. It gets them re-inspired and reconnected with it and uh, tools and, and strategies to make it work if, if they feel that they're a little bit down and out of, out of resources. Excellent. So, Mike, you basically just took 170 pages <laughs> and, and mm. put it in, and put it in 10 minutes. So that was perfect. yeah. You don't that need to buy the book any, anymore. <laughs> no, I think you know. I one of the things that I love about your books is how much personality, how much Mike is actually in the book. The first time I read <laughs> the Pumpkin Plan was, I remember thinking like, man, I actually feel like I I know him. His attitude, his it wasn't just normal. I took writing classes in college, and it wasn't just your normal. Um, you know, straightforward uh, reading that was kind of boring. It, it was, it was very, I, I almost felt like at times I was having conversations and, and uh, I took it more direct than I do a lot of other books. So I, I thought it was, I thought it was fantastic. So no, they definitely still need to read the book um, because of the, the stories and the attitude and the, and the comical relief that's in it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the greatest compliments I got was uh, an old college friend reached out to me and said, I read your book, The Toy Paper Entrepreneur, and, and fell in love with it. But it's like, I got to tell you something. I bought the book because I heard of the book. I didn't know you were the author. And as he was reading it, he's like, holy cow, this sounds just like my old college buddy. I mean, this is like my... And it was only once he was halfway through or, or a certain point that he's like, who's the author? And he's like, no way. And that's when he called me. And it was the ultimate compliment. It was the ultimate compliment when someone says, that's exactly who I know you to be. And, and why that's important for authors or for anyone, any brand, is if you're authentic. If, you're, if, you, if it's a true representation of yourself, when you're out doing a speaking engagement or however else the public will see you on Facebook or whatever it is, there's absolute consistency. I think it's a shame when when authors and, and other people do this too, when they present their brand to be something they're not, then when you meet them in person, it's it's the great letdown. It's like, this yeah. this isn't the same guy. Who, who the hell is this? So y y be authentic. It, it, it pays off. It may not tr resonate with everyone. Some people are definitely turned off by my books. There's, some, <laughs> there's definitely some edge to them. Um, but for the folks it does resonate with, any facet of, of or experience they have with my brand is is it's consistent. Yeah, no, that that that's huge. I I've, I've never minded. I've always heard people talk about throwing a book, you know, after after reading something that they didn't necessarily like. Because yeah, books do that sometimes. Sometimes they they punch you in the sure. gut. But it, yeah. I, I think if you if you know the the real reason why you're reading the book is to get as many gut punches as you can and go fix what what you're not doing right. So I actually I actually there's a sense of it's that good kind of pain, you know. Yeah, after, yeah, after you're yeah. done working out, you know that 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 pain that you're like, okay. This doesn't feel good. My legs don't feel good walking up the stairs, but you know what? I got better today. So yeah, yeah that's like, a great way to see it. So this next question I think is is somewhat mean, but it's such a phenomenal question for the reader. And, and it's basically, again, we just talked about, you just uh, in 10 minutes covered uh, or, or gave kind of a bird's eye view of the toilet paper entrepreneur. And now this next question is, if the reader can only take away one concept, principle or action item out of your entire book, what would you want that to be? It's this, that the lack of resources is, in fact, a massive, massive asset. It's, it's perhaps your biggest asset. You see, when we have resources, then the, the path we want to take, the first path that comes to mind, the obvious path, becomes the doable path. Conversely, when you have no resources, the obvious um, may not be doable. And therefore, it forces you to think of alternatives. And that's where innovation comes from. When you can't follow the obvious, you have to break the rules. So it's, the, it's triggered by the lack of resources. And that's why, you know, some people are like, gosh, how come large companies struggle to be innovative? Look at what's happening to Apple now, right? Steve Jobs passed away, this amazing innovator. And now this massive company that has all these people that they recruit and all those things, they're starting to struggle to innovate. The reason is the obvious path is, is easy to do for them. They have all this funding, so just do the obvious. A small business or any business that does, has a lack of resources are ultimately the rule breakers, and the rule breakers are the innovators, and the innovators change the world. Mm. 
So this next question, I just pulled some quotes out of what you just said, but this next question is, do you have a favorite quote from your book? And this can be, I, I think this was originally a way for the author to, to, to hopefully throw out humility and kind of be able to talk about something that they wrote that they really loved and thought would be mm. impactful. So either a quote that, that you wrote that you love or a quote that maybe uh, um, that's resonated with your audience. It's the one that gets tweeted the most. It's the one that you see on Facebook or, or whatever that you're quoted on. So your choice, but we're looking for a, for a quote. Yeah, so I think it's this, that successful businesses don't get rich quick. They get rich right. And how I distinguish that is when we go into business, there's there's two two common entry points. One is to come into a business because, ooh, this is a big money opportunity. Another way to go into it is like, wow, this this business resonates with who I am. And interestingly, that's that latter choice, this business resonates with who I am, that I find brings the most wealth to people, it brings satisfaction, it brings stick to itness, and it brings it brings ultimately, ultimately the most financial wealth. Folks that go into it just because, oh, it's a big money opportunity. Yeah, some of those folks are successful. Um, but most of them that get rich quicks will not get rich quick and then look for the next get rich quick and be constantly jumping around. So I, I believe in that quote so much. I now, whenever I autograph a book, that's the common quote I'll put in there. I'll say, here's to getting rich, comma, right. Perfect. Okay, very good. So, Mike, there's no doubt in my mind that your books create paradigm shifts for individuals and help them move forward. And that's this last question is really, what's a book that you've read that created a paradigm shift or had such an impact on you? And will you share that with our audience? Oh my God. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> There's an unlimited amount. So I'm going to tell you one you probably have never heard of, uh, at least in a business sense. And I'll tell you how it affected me. It's called Moonwalking with Einstein. And it's a fascinating read about uh, memory experts of memory competitors, in fact, is I think is their term. And these are guys and gals that go to uh, areas to compete and they'll memorize like 50 decks of card in se- cards in sequence. They'll memorize every person's name in the audience and stuff like that. And why it, it was such a paradigm shift for me is if you ask people about memory, they'll say, I can't remember, you know, I can't remember anyone's name. I meet someone, I forget their name within 10 seconds of meeting them. My memory sucks. And the reality is, as I was reading this book, is anyone has this capability. It's just the process we go about to 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 memorize things that, that's falling apart. And it just kind of broadened my eyes that whenever I believe I can't do something, chances are I can, I just don't have the right way of going about it. And I need to seek out experts. So when it came to this memory stuff, I was so fascinated about it. I was like, oh, I'm going to see if I can do this. And sure enough, using their techniques, I can memorize a deck of cards or you know, 20 random items or 100 random items and, and repeat them in sequence. And, and it's very easy once you know the method. I just have to be aware that there are alternative methods. And I think every entrepreneur needs to know that. If you read this book, Moonwalking with Einstein, you'll find that you're capable of doing things you never imagined. And you'll, if, if you have the courage to apply this to all facets of your life beyond just memory, I think you'll knock the socks off yourself. Does that help you when you go to Vegas? <laughs> I haven't, you know, I'm not a gambler, but it does help when I do my presentations. Um, when I do oh, my presentations, man. I never have notes and I don't use a PowerPoint. And I've had certain, certain circumstances where I had to do in one case, this was actually two weeks ago. Ironically, in Vegas, I was at a conference about innovation, and they asked me uh, to do a speech around innovation, uh, but something I didn't expect to speak on. And they said, uh, "You know, you're up in an hour. Can you speak on this?" Well, when there, when someone asks you to do something and they're your host and they're paying you, the answer is always yes, of course. <laughs> and so I had an hour to write a speech, and uh, they fully expected me to prepare a quick PowerPoint or some bullets. But I did it all from memory, using these memory techniques, and it, it just blew their mind. They said, "Wow, you you prepared?" Because they knew it was a last minute request that I prepared a whole speech in an hour, and um, that's how you do it with with these memory techniques. So it works for that too. Wow, that's incredible. So, so Mike, before we depart, can you recommend the best way for our listeners to get more information on you and your book, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur? 
Sure. So you can type in toilet paper entrepreneur on the web and you'll find it on Amazon and bookstores and, and you'll find my website. Uh, my website is my Mecca. So that's where everything is. It's Mike McCallowitz.com. Uh, I'm sure you'll have it in the links. That's a doozy to spell. And if, if someone can't spell it, just give your best stab at Google. The, the one benefit of having the weirdest last name on the planet is that no one else has it. So if you type in Mike McCallowitz, it, it finds me and you can type in any spelling version of it. Um, and on my website, you'll find um, f- downloads for the Toilet Paper Entrepreneurs. So you can get a couple chapters for free. Check it out. Of course, I have a blog up there. I blog daily videos. I do some television work. So there's some television stuff up there. And I have a uh, sign up too. And what's kind of cool about that is yeah, it's a newsletter. I, I share some of my best stuff there because I believe in newsletters so much. But specifically, I wrote for the Wall Street Journal for two or three years and uh, have the rights, of course, to the articles I wrote. And th- they're subscription-only articles with the Wall Street Journal now. But I share all of those articles if, uh, if people subscribe. That's a great resource. Very good. And yes, we will put the spelling and everything that you just talked about in the show notes. And it, it is nice, though, because I typed in Mike and then M-I-C-H, and Google took care of the rest for me. Oh, good. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's perfect. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming on. We look forward to uh, to diving into your uh, your next two books. Yeah, we look forward to being back on. And uh, thanks for the time. Absolutely. Thanks again for listening in today. If you would like to get your hands on The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur or any of the other resources mentioned by Mike, just look at the show notes at the elpodcast.com. Looking for your next book idea? Head over to the elpodcast.com, where Wade shares his amazing resource, the top 10 business books recommended by over 500 entrepreneurs with you for free. That's the elpodcast.com. Till the next time, keep it on the EL.